It's election season in India and cheered on by these adoring crowds, Prime Minister Narendra Modi seems set to be returning for an astonishing third successive term. For good reason, say his supporters. They claim 10 years of the Modi government have transformed India from lifting billions out of poverty to elevating India's global status. But his critics say Modi's record is far from perfect. They say his popularity is sustained thanks to a docile media, relentless PR and the stifling of dissenting voices, creating the illusion of flawless governance. In this episode of the India Report, we subject two major claims of the Modi government to journalistic scrutiny. The first of boosting India's global status and the second of turning around its economy. How many of these claims are based on facts and how much is spent? World leaders are gathering in the Indian capital, New Delhi, for the G20 summit. This summit is a huge win. It's proof of India's new role in global affairs. In the heart of New Delhi, the Prime Minister playing host to some of the most powerful leaders in the world. The occasion, the 2023 G20 summit, an annual diplomatic event. The venue and presidency rotated amongst its members every year. But with national elections less than a year away, the Modi government made a spectacle of the event, spinning India's G20 presidency as a success of his diplomacy. There was a massive PR drive, events across the country, even the logo designed to resemble the lotus, which is the symbol of Modi's party, the BJP. Traces of the publicity are visible even today. We are recording this in February 2024, six months after India concluded hosting the G20 summit. It is Brazil's turn to host the summit this year. But across India, signs like this, part of the government's PR blitz, are yet to be taken down. The grand staging of the G20 brought together the twin impulses of Modi-era foreign policy. To impress Indian voters about the country's superpower status, and to showcase the Prime Minister as a rising global statesman. The latter fact is undeniable. It is a huge pleasure to welcome Prime Minister Modi to Australia. Modi has been welcomed across many Western capitals, each visit marked by slickly staged events and photo ops. A dramatic turnaround from two decades ago, when the United States denied Modi a visa because of, quote, severe violations of religious freedoms. The travel ban stems from sectarian violence in the western state of Gujarat in 2002 when Modi was chief minister there. Over a thousand were killed, most of them Muslims. Modi has strenuously denied any hand in the violence. Concerns over the persecution of minorities and the suppression of dissent in India persist today, even if they're not voiced explicitly by many western leaders. In 2023, a US State Department's report listed significant human rights issues and abuses in India. In the past decade or so though, as the world order has fragmented and India's economy and diaspora has grown, the West, no beacon of rights and values itself, has chosen to downplay any worries regarding India's trajectory. I think there are specific reasons why Western governments have decided to put aside their concerns uh, about democratic backsliding and human rights violations in India, particularly after 2014. I think one of them is definitely the idea that India is this potential market, the bright spot as the World Bank has called it, in a world where there are very few good stories when it comes to the economy. The second, I think, is uh, the idea that in a world of unpredictability, of conflict, and of these alpha powers coming up, you know, Russia, China, uh, India stands out as a kind of counterbalance. Is there democracy in India? Is there concern for human rights? Now, all this sitting abroad, whether it's the UN Human Rights Commission or maybe some media writing about it, they do raise these kind of questions. But when you build up the rapport with the leader, then he understands. That's been a very important part of Prime Minister Modi's uh, strong effort to explain 
the perspectives of India to explain what is happening in India directly, creating a rapport with his interlocutors abroad. And this has had a very, um, I think, positive and I would say in some cases even spectacular outcome. Among those so-called spectacular outcomes was this. In 2023, Prime Minister Modi was invited to address a joint session of the United States Congress. For this honor, I extend my deepest gratitude on behalf of the 1.4 billion people of India. This was followed by a lavish state dinner at the White House, a diplomatic honor reserved for the US's closest allies. Cheers. It's important to note, though, that Modi wasn't the first Indian Prime Minister to be honored in this way. Several Indian PMs in the past have addressed joint sessions and have been hosted at the White House. It's a hallmark of Modi-era foreign policy, however, that events like these are hyped in a manner that renders previous ones invisible. The BJP says this is not just hype. India and the West are on a deal-making spree. Defence pacts with France, a major free trade agreement in the works with the UK, and high-tech deals with the USA. We're teaming up to design and develop uh, new technology that are going to transform the lives of our people around the world. It's an indication of how well-placed India is geopolitically that when the Ukraine war broke out and New Delhi refused to condemn Russia, rather than being shunned or lectured at, India found itself being wooed by all sides, not least by leaders in the West. Back home, India's role as a sought-after mediator in the Ukraine conflict was spun into election propaganda. During regional elections in 2023, the president of the BJP, out on the campaign trail, claimed that the prime minister had managed to bring a halt to the war in Ukraine to allow Indian students to escape. When the foreign ministry was asked in a press briefing for details of this diplomatic masterstroke, reality didn't quite stack up. We got the specific inputs that look, this is a this is a route that's available. These are the places that uh, Indian citizens should go by this time. Uh, we conveyed that to our citizens. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, many could make it, but uh, extrapolating that to say that somebody is holding a bombing uh, or that, uh, you know, this is somewhere we are coordinating that, I think is, uh, is absolutely inaccurate. Despite the denial, the story didn't die. It came up again in a BJP campaign video for the upcoming elections. <laughs> In the normal course, falsehoods of this kind by a political party would have been blown out of the water. However, in a media landscape that's been largely brought to heel, the Modi government's achievements are amplified, its setbacks downplayed. And it isn't as if there haven't been setbacks. One of the most significant, a sensational accusation by the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, that India had orchestrated the killing of a Sikh separatist on Canadian soil. Credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar. India's Foreign Minister denied the accusation and blamed Canada for giving safe haven to Sikh extremists who favor creating an independent state in Punjab in India's northwest. In the last uh, uh, few years, uh, Canada actually has seen a lot of organized crime, uh, you know, relating to, you know, the secessionist uh, uh, forces, organized crime, violence, extremism. But weeks later, the crisis snowballed. A similar allegation came from India's ally, the United States, that India had attempted to assassinate a Sikh separatist on US territory. Given India's growing strategic importance to the West, the setback is unlikely to cause serious diplomatic damage. But in India's own backyard, there's been a breakdown of relations with China, 
a standoff between two strongmen leaders. The spiking of tensions took place despite Modi's outreach. There have been 18 one-to-one -one meetings between him and China's President Xi Jinping. I do agree that the factor of China is, is uh, very significant. I would say quite clearly that uh, Prime Minister Modi made every effort. There's no doubt about that. You know, there were all the, the uh, bilateral meetings. They had so many other meetings and summits. But what happened in 2020 at Galwan came as a complete shock. A series of Chinese army incursions in the Galwan Valley, a contested Himalayan region, boiled over into a deadly clash in 2020 some of it captured in video released by Chinese authorities. It was the first major instance of fighting in nearly four decades. At least 20 Indian and four Chinese soldiers reportedly died in the fighting. China is not the only neighbour with whom talks have broken down. The situation has also deteriorated with Pakistan. But here, a collapse of diplomacy may have actually worked to the Modi government's advantage. The Hindu right, represented by Modi and his party, the BJP, have long used Pakistan as part of their wider campaign to target Indian Muslims, insinuating their loyalties lie with India's Muslim-majority neighbour. Even so, when he first came to power a decade ago, Modi made a bold gesture inviting the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, to his swearing-in. A year later, another surprise move. He dropped into Lahore for an unexpected meeting with Sharif. But that promising start soured quickly. The world is aware that Pakistan has a long history of violence and terrorism against India. India doubled down on its accusations of Pakistan backing proxy terrorism on Indian soil and of worsening border tensions. I've got breaking news coming in. The Matters came to a head in 2019 when, as retaliation for a terrorist strike on Indian troops in Kashmir, like India launched unprecedented airstrikes deep inside Pakistan's territory with the aim of taking out terrorist camps. The bombardment, conducted months before India's national elections that year, led to a near total breakdown of relations with Pakistan. But the airstrikes galvanized the BJP's nationalist credentials contributing to a landslide second term for Modi. I want to say first time voters, do you vote for the first vote Pakistan in Balakot? The air strike is the name of the people of the people of the world. New Delhi's muscular nationalism may have contributed to a breakdown of talks with Pakistan, but it has drawn India closer to other countries with similar ideologies, like Israel. Modi was the first Indian Prime Minister to visit the country in 2017 and has a relationship with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that few other world leaders have been able to sustain. However, the India-Israel relationship goes beyond the personal connections between the two leaders. Israel is the second largest supplier of military equipment to India. For observers, it's unsurprising that two majoritarian nations should have such a close relationship. But Hindu nationalism is not the only driving force guiding Modi-era foreign policy. It's also driven by pragmatism, the best example of which is the remarkable outreach to the Muslim Arab world, a region known in Indian foreign policy circles as West Asia. No other Indian leader has engaged with Arab leaders quite like Modi has. In 2019, Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, was warmly received in New Delhi at the height of the scandal of the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was dismembered reportedly on the orders of MBS. Then there are relations with the United Arab Emirates. Modi has visited the country seven times more than any Indian leader before him. President Mohammed bin Zayed, known as MBZ, calls Modi his brother and was key in approving the building of a Hindu temple in Abu Dhabi. If the biggest support of my brother is His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. 
But the deep investment in building a relationship with the Arab world has at times been threatened by rising Islamophobia in India and how openly senior members of the BJP proclaim it. In 2022, during a TV discussion, a BJP spokesperson made derogatory remarks about the Prophet Muhammad. It drew widespread and rare condemnation from not just Arab nations, but Muslim majority nations around the world. I think even the government was not expecting the kind of response that they saw. Social media picked it up. Uh, it became enough of an issue that a vice presidential trip was cut short uh, abroad. Um, it became enough of an issue that party leaders here were made to, were mobilized to speak about the foreign policy aspect uh, of uh, what was essentially seen as a as a, as a hate speech comment. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, the government learned a very strong lesson. Go by the record and India's foreign policy under Modi has not been, as his government claims, one of unbroken successes. There have been setbacks as well. Let's now turn to the other big claim made by the Modi government that they have turbocharged India's economy. They cite a number of indicators as proof, the most prominent being the assertion that India today is the fastest growing economy in the world. Indeed it is. India grew at over 8% in the last quarter, the highest in the world. It's instructive though to understand how this has come to be. Well, there are two parts to this. So one issue is how much has the economy as a whole actually been growing? And the reason we are the fastest growing is because we had the biggest slump during COVID-19. Okay, so in 2020, we were one of the worst hit economies. And we have recovered from there. So of course, therefore, the recovery means if you're getting back to your previous line, then it's going to be faster than others. But the second part of it is actually probably more important. It's a very K-shaped recovery, as they call it. Really, it's been confined to the top 20% of the population at the most. Uh, which has been doing very well. But on the other hand, the rest of the economy and the major part of the population is doing worse, I would say. The numbers back this up. A recent survey found inequality in India is at a 100-year high, with the top 1% owning 40% of the national wealth. The government claims the benefits of growth are not limited to the wealthy, but that it is trickling down, lifting millions out of poverty, many more than in the past. Garibi hatao ke nare, desh ajad hua tab se hum sunte aaye. Humne bimari ki jad ko pakda hai. Desh garibi se mukti ki aur tej gati se aage pad raha hai. So what the government has done is that it's changed how it is going to define poverty. It's using one multidimensional poverty measure, which is, shall we say, problematic, and which is designed to suggest that less and less people are poor. We have a very, very large number of poor, and all kinds of data are telling us that not only do we still have a very large number of income poor, but other kinds of poverty, like food poverty, may well be increasing. So there's no you know, uh, data which is you know, being given uh, which is being uh, created by the government, okay? It is the data that is flowing from the ground level and it is being calculated and just pr being presented to the people. We, in fact, the Modi government does not want to hide anything. But as the government is not hiding the bad news and poverty is declining, why, some ask, is the Modi government extending distress measures announced during the COVID pandemic? like extra rations to the poor. Brushing aside these contradictions, the government has gone on a major handout spree. Not just food grains, but free or subsidized cooking gas cylinders, houses and toilets. A big talking point ahead of elections. While many of these benefits are not new, economists have mapped how the scale of the distribution has spiked after Modi came to power, increasingly using digital payment pipelines for more efficient delivery. Experts have a name for it, new welfareism, where the government moves away from its traditional role of providing education and health and instead focuses on quick fix benefits for immediate political gain. It's very hard to make changes in the delivery of education, the delivery of health care, and see the changes happening in a short while and to get credit for that. 
So what do you do? Well, you focus instead on you know, what in this country are called freebies. Uh, you handouts. handouts, direct benefits transfers. And what's important is those have become much more efficient mm. today. Uh, when I send you a thousand rupees a month, it reaches you. Mm. That's the beauty of the digitalization of the benefits transfer that has happened in this country. The downside of that is it's much easier for me to do that than to improve your schools or to improve your health care. And especially when I can put my photo on a full page newspaper ad saying, I gave you the thousand rupees or I gave you, uh, you know, free gas or subsidized gas, uh, I get the benefit as the leader of the party. Indeed, the leader of the party is front and center of many of the government's pro-poor schemes. Modi's image is printed on bags of free food rations. Welfare policies bear his title in the name. A low-cost housing scheme is called the PM Awas Yojana. A scheme to transfer cash to farmers, PM Kisan. A scheme to open no-frills bank accounts, PM Jan Dhan Yojana. A small loan scheme, the PM Mudra Yojana. An insurance scheme called the Ayushman Bharat PM Jan Arogya Yojana. Prime Minister is, you know, a, uh, a kind of unifying factor for our country. A Prime Minister is elected majoritatively and it's a unifying factor. So today it is Prime Minister Modi. Tomorrow after 10 years or 15 years, there might be many, many Prime Ministers who will be coming and going, right? The opposition disagrees. They say the Modi-branded handouts are meant to bolster the cult of the Prime Minister and douse voter anger against the government's failures, like a lack of decent jobs for the waves of educated young Indians entering the workforce every year. Videos routinely go viral of thousands of young men and women, many of them college graduates, queuing all night for openings for government school teachers and police constables. These are not isolated instances. According to a recent survey by the International Labour Organization, India's educated youth make up more than 65% of the total number of unemployed in the country. So, in fact, you're getting this desperation for the basic level jobs, which are low wage jobs in agriculture and in the rural areas, which shows that there's massive demand for work. But that's not the only sign. Look at the phenomena of people willing to go to Russia, to Israel, to war zones, risk their lives simply to have some employment and enable their families to survive. Even as Israel's war on Hamas rages in Gaza, hundreds of people in India are applying for jobs in Israel. People traveling in very risky circumstances to try and get to somewhere in Central America, then they can cross over to the US. These are signs of economic desperation. They are not signs of a booming, prosperous, employment-generating economy. And yet, Modi and the BJP have consistently strong poll numbers amongst Indians, especially the youth. What explains this? One reason could be a strong PR game. The Modi government has hiked the spending on ads to close to $950 million in nine years, nearly double the spending on government ads in the first nine years of the previous government. The high spending visible on billboards, bus stops, gas stations, all awash with Modi-centric PR. The front pages of national newspapers, which almost every day in the run-up to elections, carried government ads for a Modi guarantee. You know, the one thing the Modi government has been absolutely spectacular at is public relations. I mean, they have a marketing strategy that uh, defies imagination practically. All of these schemes are basically earlier UPA schemes or even earlier schemes that have been renamed and then been given a big uh, sort of dramatic push that this is Modi ki guarantee or that this is, you know, the gift of the Modi government. See, basically information only will ensure that people take those schemes. Information has to reach the person. So whenever we plan out any scheme, this is part of our agenda to ensure that the person is listening to the information so that he can benefit out of it. And this is very important. So government in any democratic setup has to spend money to inform the people. In the final analysis, whether it is in the area of foreign policy or the economy, the Modi government has had some notable achievements, but also striking setbacks. However, 
Modi and the BJP's laser focus on perception management has helped paper over the failures and amplify the successes, resulting in a likely historic third term for the Prime Minister.